welcome to my show, Searching for Integrity. My name really is John Smith, and I'm searching for people with integrity. Why? Because our country suffers from IDD, Integrity Deficit Disorder. We have as our guest today, John Suzuki and his book, American Grit, from a Japanese-American concentration camp rises by an American war hero. That's quite, a, that's quite an introduction. <laughs> Thank you, John. Nice to be here. Well, I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm interested in this other than but talking to you t anyway. Uh, and I thought that I would ask you some. Did I ask you whether or not you had a table of contents? Yes, yes, and I did send it to you. Oh, wow, okay. I missed it. Um, let's see, that's all right. That's okay. Uh, I'm looking at how many years were the, uh, what were they called, concentration camps? Uh, well, you know, it's it's interesting because the world is full of euphemisms. And um, in the United States during World War II, they called them internment camps and relocation camps. Uh, but by every definition, they were also concentration camps, but nobody wanted to call them concentration camps because they kind of reserved that term for the Holocaust in, in Europe. Um, but of course, calling it as I see it, those were more extermination camps than concentration camps. No, no, so right I'm kind that. of lifting everything to what I think is more accurate. And so in the United States, these were, in fact, concentration camps because uh, it was a concentration um, of uh, a race of people. And that's the only reason why they were there was because of their race um, and, and small in a small, uh, relatively small area with inadequate facilities. And that's uh, pretty much the definition of a concentration camp. So, right. yeah. Now, in terms of the uh, parents and children, so forth. Yes. Um, I'm going to say not very many parents are still around. Oh, uh, none. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you none. Um, <laughs> even even uh, the kids are um, uh, leaving us, are largely gone. Um, but yeah, the the it, it it affected everybody. Everybody who was of Japanese of one sixteenth Japanese ancestry um, in 1942 was evacuated um, and uh, placed in concentration camps. Ten concentration camps scattered across the United States in the worst places in the deserts, deserts and swamps in America, where nobody wanted to live. And uh, they were um, the, the, one of the prevailing attitudes at that time after Japan bombed Pearl Harbor was that if they look like the enemy, they were the enemy, including right. babies and American children. And right. um, and and you you speak of integrity. Mm -hmm. This was this was one of the worst breaches of integrity <laughs> in, in our country's history. It really was. Well, somewhere somehow. Somebody got a, a way of the rules, and these are going to be the rules. Um, was there a particular part of the other U.S. government that we know? Well, you know, one of the thing that th things that really scares me is that, um, you know, I think Franklin Delano Roosevelt, at least what I understand, was a pretty good president, and he made just a really bad decision in signing Executive Order 9066, which authorized the military to create these exclusion exclusion zones on the West Coast. Now, the thing is that there was genuine fear. There was genuine fear of the Japanese attacking the West Coast, yes. and um, and you know there there were a number of a number of different forces behind this. One of them was economic. You know, there was a whole bunch of people that uh, were envious of the of the success. Uh -huh. of folks of Japanese ancestry with their farms here in the United States, their businesses and so forth. Um, so you had that underlying current, but uh, but the big one was you had World War II happen. And, um, and so uh, even Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, FDR's wife, um, sure. was against it, was against, was against his decision. 
Um, but all the forces kind of kind of combined to make that really dark part of our history happen. Right, right. Now, what year was this when you started marching people into the camps? Uh, 1942. So it was, um, yeah, it was it was an executive order that was that was signed on February 19th of 1942, which was basically three months after or two months after um, uh, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, and um, it was it was sweeping. It was and and folks who. Uh, were caught up in it. Everybody of Japanese ancestry, American citizens and non non citizens alike, um, were caught up in this in this dragnet, and uh, they lost everything. You know, they lost their homes, right. they lost their farms, they lost their businesses, uh, because all they could take with them was what they could carry, and you can't carry a farm. <laughs> and <No>. so, <laughs> and so they they had no choice but to. Uh, uh, but to get rid of everything because they they didn't they had no idea if they how long they were going to be gone, um, uh -huh. what was going to happen to them if they were ever going to come back. Um, nobody knew anything, and so it was it was it was a very terrifying time uh, for the folks back then. The only reference point they had was what was happening with the with the Jews in uh, in Europe in yes. Nazi Germany. Yeah. Right. Um, when did this end? It ended in 1945 after the war ended, and um, okay. and after the war ended, uh, they they closed the camps, and um, and and they gave. I'm being a little bit sarcastic, but not much. But they gave everybody a pat on the back, uh, uh, twenty five dollars and a one way bus ticket anywhere right. wherever mm -hmm. they felt like going. And it was thank you very much. Um, but we found nothing. We found not a single person who was uh, convicted of spying um, of right. Japanese ancestry. Uh, but you know what? Uh, we'll, we'll call it good and uh, have a nice life. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just terrible. Just terrible. Yeah. Right. Were well, there a lot of complaints about the food? Um, well, uh, in a lot of cases, the food was not for human consumption because it was spoiled. And, um, and you know, the big thing was that uh, – it was army food, right? right. It was army right. food. These people were stuck in camps surrounded by barbed wire um, with armed guards, with armed soldiers. And uh, a lot of times my understanding is that they were fed army food that the army didn't even want. And so, <laughs> so one of the first, one of the first um, orders of, of priority was food. And, mm -hmm. you know, when they, when they were inside these camps, and, and again, these camps are out in the deserts, 100 degree plus in the summertime, zero degrees in the wintertime. Um, uh, the, the buildings were made out of uh, pine lumber and tar paper, and that's it. And, wow. um, you know, they had to come together to make, make their own food. So the cooks who were uh, cooks, you know, before they were interned, uh, became the cooks for the camps right. and the doctors yeah. became the doctors and the hospitals that they built. And the school teachers became school, school teachers in the camps in the, in the schools that they built. And, um, and yeah, it was, it was, it was a crazy, it was, it was a crazy time. So uh, top priority was food. Uh, one interesting tidbit was that uh, the, the, there was one concentration camp that I write about called Minidoka and it was in um, uh, right. the deserts of Iowa, uh, Idaho at the time. And if you go there now, which I did, if you go to where Minidoka used to be, you'll see that it's completely green and fertile farmland. Back in 1942, it was desert. It was it was sagebrush and tumbleweeds. Yeah. And you know, the Japanese inmates there, they brought irrigation to the deserts of, of Idaho, Idaho. And now it's 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 all green. It's farmland. Um so uh yeah, that was all. That part of it was all about uh, growing their own food that uh, that they were accustomed to. Well, I've had some of those rations when I was in Nam, and uh, <laughs> I, we were told they were improved, but you know, no thanks. <laughs> uh, sure, compared to what? <laughs> well, I was lucky. I was I was never in the field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, so I, I wasn't a grunt. I, I got lucky about that part. Yeah. Um, when the people and children, um, did they have educational schools there? That 
Yeah. Well, they, they built them. They, yeah. they, they built them within the camps. And so um, they built stores, they built hospitals, they had their own uh, police detail and fire department <laughs> and, and, uh, and schools. And so, um, you know, they, they, they came together as a community and, right. uh, and built everything, everything that they needed. Um, and uh, so they, they, they figured it out. They figured they took a really, really, really bad situation, worst situation of their lives and and came together and you know instead of rolling rolling up in a ball and uh, yeah. and cowering under the sofa they they came together and said okay how are, how are we going to make the best of this and what can we do and they did and they did and they created everything they needed to did they have schools there beyond children um say older teenagers or even you know uh, well, yeah they had they had they had schools all the way from K K through 12 um, I don't know if they had formal schools for adults. Um, uh, I don't know, but they, but the uh, schools for the for the kids, they 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 created and managed themselves. And you know, this the, this concentration camp in in Idaho with thirteen thousand people became one of the big one of the largest towns in Idaho. You know, and right. um, and so yeah, they they all came together. That's good. Uh, well, they have didn't have any other choice. Yeah, um, that's the way I would see it. Now, did um, what about health? Was were, were medics hanging around? Is there was there a hospital there? Yeah, you know they built they built hospitals. Um, a thousand babies were born <laughs> in the camp, really? and, <laughs> yeah. and that's um, great. And so, yeah, and, and because a lot of the a lot of the people, a lot of the uh, Japanese Americans were doctors. And nurses, you know, on the outside in their real life, and right. so, um, so yeah, uh, they they managed as best they could. It was it was it was terrible. I mean, there's also mental health there mental health problems. A uh, bunch of people committed suicide, and you know, it and to this day, you know, there there are folks who are suffering from PTSD from that whole experience. Right. Um, uh, but yeah, they they managed the best they could. Right. Well, that's encouraging. Um, I think as a as a people, a Japanese people, they've got a lot of what's a good word for it? They got a lot of good stuff. I mean, they're they're brave, brave people, mm -hmm. and how they took it on, what they were given, and they they as best they could dealt with it. Yeah, and and part of it part of it was their culture. There's a there's a saying in in Japanese called that that. Uh, shikata ganai. Um, roughly translated, that means, you know, suck it up. Life's not fair. There's nothing you can do about it. So get on with it. And um, and that was a real uh, common sentiment um, among the um, within the Japanese community. Um, uh, fall down eight times. Uh, fall down seven times. Get up eight. You know yeah. that came from it came from the Japanese. And and the last thing I'll share is. Uh, you will always hear Japanese folks saying "gaman," um, which means "suck it up" and and don't complain. Do do not complain. There's nothing you can do about it, and don't bring shame to your family. So right. all of the all of those kinds of things kind of um, uh, resonated across the community um, because they all shared those values. Yeah. What well, was there a church there? Was there were there any religions? Yeah, you know they they. Um, uh, I will say I'll, I'll say this as an irony, in that um, you know, a part of part of my story, a big part of my story, was about um, over a thousand men who volunteered out of that one Minidoka concentration camp in Idaho to fight and, in many cases, die for the Ameri for the United States Army, who put them and their families in those camps to begin with, right? And then right. they went off to fight for the United States Army while their families remained imprisoned by the United States Army. And the irony that I want to speak about is that, you know, when, when a family loses a, a soldier, um, a detail of American officers comes to that soldier's home and presents an American flag to their, to, to their parents. Well, imagine, if you will, a detail of American, American soldiers and officers coming to the barracks of the parents in a concentration camp to present them with a gold star and an American flag in an American prison. Huh. It, it, it just breaks your heart. And, yeah. and so, um, 
So back to your comment or your question about churches. Yeah, you know, there there were a lot of Buddhists, a lot of Christians. And so um, as with everything else, they may do. And um, and the ultimate irony of the whole thing was that here these guys were fighting for freedom and democracy around the world. And yet their families were stuck in a concentration camp with their constitutional right. rights taken away in America. <laughs> I mean, it's just yeah. it's just mind boggling. And um and you know, my 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 whole mission when I learned about, you know, all of these different stories, I learned I knew a lot about it, but I didn't know a lot all of it, um, was to make folks aware that this happened um and uh make sure that the experiences of all those folks never get forgotten. So we never do it again. You know? So oh, from 42 to 45, that's three years mm-hmm. then. Yeah, three and a half years. Three long years. Yeah. Half mm-hmm. year. Um, now, after when it was closed, were, th- were there any uh, assistance with uh, yeah, w- well, with jobs and things like that? Uh, well, really interesting that you you asked that question. Um, the only assistance really that was notable was twenty five dollars and a one way bus ticket, and. Um, the sad part about it was that they had spent three and a half years building these communities after having been evicted from their homes, and they built these communities in these camps as their homes, and now they're being evicted all over again with with the twenty five dollar pat on the back. the The really sad part um, that I learned was that um, you know during the war they were they were feared and they, they were viewed as the enemy, right? Um, after the war, when they went home. Uh, it in a lot of ways it was worse because they were not only viewed as the enemy, but they were viewed as the enemy that lost. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the guys, the guys up in Seattle, they came home and wanted to join the veterans of foreign wars, and they were rejected because of their Japanese ancestry. I mean, these guys became among the most decorated war heroes in the in American history, and the veterans of foreign wars, the VFW, refused them. So when they came back, um, it was tough. It was tough for them to find jobs. It was tough for them to find homes and housing. Um, it was it was just tough all around. Um, and you know, a, a, a quick story. I, I write oh. about a gentleman named Daniel Inouye. Daniel Inouye uh, died in two thousand nineteen, I think it was. But anyway, he was a, he was a United States senator for almost fifty years, and he lost his right arm in World War II. When he came back to the United States, he walked into a barbershop with his right arm missing and wearing his American uniform. And the barber said, young man, you need to take a look at that sign. And the sign says, we don't cut Jap hair. This guy went on to become a Medal of Honor recipient, and he lost his right arm wearing his American uniform. And that's how he was treated, right? And so it took a long, long time, uh, decades, for for that um, for a lot of that sentiment to to subside and go away. So yeah, it was it was tough. It was tough in a lot of cases. Well, that's a sorry situation, and mm-hmm. obviously they didn't have any any guidance with respect to it ought to be done and it ought to be done sooner. Um, so I hear, guess here, I don't know. It's uh, what is it? 75 years now that your book is late? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Better late than never, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. But that's that's the thing. You know, I in my uh I retired, I retired a little over a year ago from from my career, my working career um mm-hmm. in, in technology. Um and I traveled a lot. And you know, as I traveled the country and traveled the world, it was amazing to me how many people didn't know about these camps and about what happened right. in this right. really dark chapter of our history. And so that that's that was kind of the impetus for me mm-hmm. um, of making people aware, reminding people that this happened, especially in this world today where, you know, history is being canceled. People are being canceled. And uh, this, um, this, this story just isn't being taught as widely as I think it should be. Um, and, you know, in a lot of cases, it's just being kind of swept under the rug. So um, my 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 uh, hope is to raise that awareness and raise that education because uh, history forgotten often has a way of repeating itself. 
And this is one chapter that can't happen again in this country. Well, uh, yeah, it needs to be done and you're doing it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I'm trying to. It, yeah, you're doing a good job with that. Um, was there anything, in a sense, left out that you can think well, of that that they... In, in, in terms of this conversation? Yes. Um. Uh, well, I mean, there's there, there there's story after story after story. Um, I, I will say this, you know, mm -hmm. when pe people people will often ask me, John, do you really think this can happen in America again? And I'll refer to two situations. The first one, which happened about you know twenty years ago or so, um, mm -hmm. was nine eleven. Nine eleven, when when we were attacked. Somebody came up with a misguided idea that all Muslims must be terrorists and therefore should be rounded up and, and put away. Um, I, I am proud to say that a large part of the Japanese community rose up and said, no, 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 no. Been there, done that, folks. That ain't going to happen again. Yeah. And a story that, that I learned that uh, not many people know about was that President Bush at the time had a transportation secretary named Norman Mineta. And Norman Mineta had spent part of his childhood in an American concentration camp during World War II. Mm -hmm. And so when uh, President Bush's advisors came to him and said, hey, look, uh, this is what we needed to do. President Bush said, whatever you come to me with, do not come to me with a solution that that guy has already experienced. In other words, do not tell me that we need to round people up. And sure. it didn't happen. But but more recently, more recently, what's really scary was COVID, right? There was talk about rounding up everybody who had COVID, and putting them and and isolating them, and you know it's 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 fear, it's fear and isolation of people and bucketize what I call bucketizing of people mm -hmm. that um, that got us into this mess to begin with, and um, it's happening, it's all happening right now, and and the one thing that you and I can promise everybody in your audience. Mm -hmm. Is that something really, really bad is going to happen again? Is mm -hmm. it, it, bad stuff happens? It's unavoidable, and the question is going to be how are we going to respond, you know, to the bad things that happen, and and not, you know, not place blame. Blame and fear are are, are two really, really big problems right. in this country right now. Right. You're right. <laughs> which which are probably reasons, which are probably two big reasons why integrity is so hard to find these days. It is. Uh, and I can't imagine why it, why it's there. And it's mm -hmm. all those people that you know. Do you have any integrity? They'll start uh, going through their pockets, and like, and they don't know what they don't know what it what it is. Yeah, yeah. It's sad, it's sad, it's sad. Well, sad. it's it, it, it's it's. I love that. I love that you're you're bringing this to the forefront, and um, and challenging people. You know. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it, it really, really is important. And, um, you know, in our world these days of fear, and I'll, I'll call it fear and blame, you mm -hmm. know, if there's a way that we could just take some of that energy of fear and shift it a little bit away from fear and towards a little bit more love, and if we could take some of that energy of blame and shift it to mm -hmm. a little bit more personal responsibility, you know, I think if we could do that, um, we can move mountains. And that that may that may start shifting people over to the other other end of the spectrum, you know, of integrity. And and my definition of integrity, by the way, I've heard I've heard lots of definitions. One of one of which is integrity is what you do when nobody's looking. And <laughs> I personally believe that integrity is the good stuff you do, especially when nobody's looking. And right. the right things to do. You you always do the right, right. thing. Set aside the yeah. good thing. Sometimes the yeah. right thing to do isn't isn't always uh, good, but always doing the right thing, especially when nobody's looking. And you know, it, it's it, it, the example that I use is, you know, you give somebody ten dollars for five dollars worth of worth of groceries, and they give you change for a twenty dollar bill. Um, do you just kind of look at them and stick that money in your pocket? Or do you say, hey, look, you gave me a little bit too much change? Uh, just little, little stuff like that. Um, it's it it's a little nice. things that, that make up uh, the person who you are, in my view. Let's talk about your book, where it's sitting for sale. Yeah. So 
I'm finding it in in more and more places, which is which is really cool. It's only been out for um, you know for just under three months, uh, but it's an Amazon bestseller, um, yes. and I'm finding it in interestingly, I'm finding it in uh, places like museums. The Japanese American National Museum uh, picked up my book American Grit, and which is which is amazing for me. That's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. And folks are telling me that they're starting to see it in stores. Um, but if 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 your audience is interested in it, it's called American Grit. Uh, easiest place is to get it from Amazon. Right. Um, and uh, yeah. yeah, and and then that's it right there. <laughs> it's it's got an American <laughs> flag on it. And you know, one of my one of my friends told me they said, John, you know, you you named it American Grit. I said, yeah. They said, you know, when people think of the words American Grit. They don't think of a bunch of Japanese people in concentration camps. <laughs> right. No. No, they don't. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, they, yeah, know, but... they don't know. They don't know about it. Yeah, exactly. That's, your, exactly. that's your job. Yep. 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 That's what I picked up. Well, I want to thank you uh, for being our guest today. And my I want pleasure. To thank my, my listeners, my listeners. Um, and, um, you know, tuning into searching for integrity is always uh, a good thing. And um, I also have my adios, and it goes so long, and happy trails to all. Indeed. Indeed. Until we see you again.